sure this is back on. Yep, I'm sure. Yes. Good evening. Welcome to the Hampton History Museum and our Port Hampton Lecture Series. I'm Alan Holman, I'm the curator here. And tonight our speaker is Jonathan White, Associate Professor of American Studies at Christopher Newport University. He's the author and editor of 13 books, including Emancipation, The Union Army and the Re-election of Abraham Lincoln from 2014, which was a finalist for both the Lincoln Prize and Jefferson Davis Prize, a best book in Civil War Monitor and winner of the Abraham Lincoln Institute's 2015 Book Prize. He serves as Vice Chair of the Lincoln Forum and on the boards of the Abraham Lincoln Association, the Abraham Lincoln Institute, as well as Ford's Theater Advisory Council. His most recent books include Midnight in America, Darkness, Sleep, and Dreams During the Civil War from uh, 2017, which was selected as a best book by Civil War Monitor, and Our Little Monitor, The Greatest Invention of the Civil War from 2018, which he co-authored with Anna Gibson Holloway. In October of 2021, he published To Address You as a Friend, African Americans' Letters to Abraham Lincoln uh, with the University of North Carolina Press, and in November of 2021, published My Work Among the Freedmen, The Civil War and Reconstruction Letters of Harriet M. Buss with the UVA Press. Tonight, he will be speaking to us about his new book, just released in 2022, A House Built by Slaves, African American Visitors to the Lincoln White House, and you can get this book here. Uh, from our gift store. If you have questions about anything that uh, we're going to learn here this evening, feel free to comment in the comment section on Facebook Live, and we will collect those and uh, ask Dr. White at the end of the lecture. Uh, we'll ask those questions to him and, uh, and try to come up with an answer. So, Dr. White, welcome. Thank you. That's a great way to put it, try to come up with an answer. Well, if we were to drive about 30 minutes south of here to Mount Olive Cemetery in Norfolk, we would see a very badly damaged and neglected headstone, which you see here. And this stone was erected in 1880, and when it was put in place, thousands of people from Norfolk came for the celebration. There was an oration, there was an address, there was singing. And buried beneath this headstone is a Methodist minister named Richard H. Parker. Parker had been born in York County, Virginia, sometime between 1803 and 1808. He was the youngest of 14 children. As a mere boy, he was sold away from his mother, the last of her children to be sold away, and taken across the water to Norfolk, Virginia. Now, Parker was anxious to learn how to read, and so he would get little marbles and give them to white children and bribe them with these marbles to learn his letters. And he would walk around the streets of Norfolk picking up nails, and he would then take those nails and sell them and take the money, and with that money, he bought a primer. Now, it was illegal for black children or any African Americans to learn how to read at that time, and so he would hide his primer, this little book, at the top, in the side of his hat. And one quote that comes down to us is that the book wore the hair from the top of his head. His master's daughter was kindly towards him and taught him, started teaching him how to read so that he could take the next step in his lessons. But when his master found out, she was severely reprimanded and he received 15 blows. Nevertheless, Parker persevered. And the first chapter of the Bible that he ever read was Matthew chapter 5, which contains the Sermon on the Mount. He later said, oh, how I do love that chapter. Now, in his spare bits of time, Parker, over the years, would hire himself out so that he could earn some money that he could keep. So he's working extra hours in the evenings. He eventually saved enough money to purchase his own freedom. It cost him $3,000 to be free. By the time the Civil War comes around, he's somewhere in his mid to late 50s. And when Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation on January 1st, 1863, there was a massive celebration among African Americans in Norfolk. One African American later recalled that first day of freedom as, quote, the greatest day ever witnessed in Norfolk. Later that year, Reverend Parker said this, since God has freed us, the winds blow entirely different. On Independence Day in 1864, Reverend Parker proudly proclaimed, this is the greatest 4th of July I ever knew. 
Thank God for what my eyes see and my ears hear. I have often heard the white people talk of the day of independence, but this is my first and your first one. And Parker went on to say that he wished his voice was loud and long enough to reach Jefferson Davis in Richmond so that the Confederate president could know that today we, the colored people, are celebrating the 4th of July. Now, he never met Jefferson Davis. He never went to Richmond to meet Davis. But Reverend Parker would meet Abraham Lincoln. Sometime in the spring of 1864, Parker decided to travel to Washington, D.C. He was part of a delegation of black men who were going to meet with Lincoln to try to persuade the president to support black suffrage. Parker got to Washington, he toured the Capitol, he toured the Treasury Building and the Patent Office, and then he went to the White House. And he sat down outside of the White House in Lafayette Park, and he put his arms up, or his arms out and stretched out his legs, and he looked at the White House and he said, ah, this is the air of freedom. He then, though, stood up, crossed the street, and went into the White House itself. When he entered Lincoln's office, he said he felt like the Queen of Sheba must have felt when she entered the halls of King Solomon in ancient Israel. But he walked into the office and was surprised by what he saw because he didn't see anyone who looked important enough to be the president. He said, all I saw was a plain farmer-like looking man, tall and thin, about as handsome in the face as I am. That man stood up, he said, stood right up as soon as we entered. And we knew who he and we, he knew who we were. He made us a hearty welcome and offered us seats. And Parker then said, "What an honor to have our president offer me a cheer." And when he said "cheer," I think he was making a little bit of a joke about Lincoln's Midwestern accent. Parker and his fellow visitors introduced themselves to the president. They urged him to support black suffrage, and Lincoln spoke in a kindly way in response. He said, don't be in a hurry, friends. You'll get your rights by and by, just as soon as you're prepared to have them. And, he sa and Parker then said, I knew as soon as I heard that man speak and saw his kind face that he would be a good friend to my people. And I've never had a cause to change my mind. Parker then returned to Norfolk with a contented spirit, and he said, with a full heart. In January of 1865, there was another big emancipation celebration in Norfolk, Virginia, and Parker spoke there, and he thanked God for freedom and the blessings that surround the freed people. He prayed for the success of the Union cause, for our armies and navies, our rulers, for the perfect annihilation of slavery in our country and the world. And then, perhaps to the surprise of some in attendance, Parker prayed, he said, for each enemy of our country, that they may be brought to God and that their counsels come to naught. It seems that the lesson of the Sermon on the Mount were still with him all those years later that he prayed for his enemies. When he closed his prayer, the crowd gave three cheers for Abraham Lincoln and three more for the Emancipation Proclamation. Parker would visit the White House again a few months later in April of 1865. But sadly, this would be to see Lincoln's body resting in the East Room of the White House after he'd been assassinated by John Wilkes Booth. Parker died back here in Norfolk in 1878, and an obituary that was published said that he occupied a warm place in the hearts of all his brethren. Sincere to the core, he was not capable of double action, full of faith and of courage, whether as slave or a citizen, he was ever doing his master's will. And his master, of course, was his heavenly father, not one of the five men who owned him while he was here on earth. Now, Richard Parker is an incredible story, someone who rose from bondage in this region of Virginia to purchase his own freedom and then become a, a black leader in this community and to go on and meet Abraham Lincoln at the White House. But in fact, he was one of hundreds of African Americans to meet Lincoln in wartime Washington. Hundreds of black men and women entered the executive mansion for public receptions and private meetings. Some joined Abraham and Mary Lincoln for tea. Others, like, like Parker, boldly called for political rights and equality. 
Some came by the invitation of the president. Others walked in completely unannounced and uninvited. Some came to offer their services to the Union Army. Others called to ensure that Lincoln would, would give equality to African-American soldiers. Some brought gifts for President Lincoln. Others went away with food or money that they desperately needed. A remarkable drama unfolded in wartime Washington, and this is what I describe in my book. Black people entered the White House claiming the president as their president, and the White House as their people's house too. There was a White House waiter, and a young boy, African-American boy, who as an older man later in life said there was no color line there because the Lincolns opened up the White House to people of all races. Now, I'm gonna focus my remarks on a couple of moments where African-Americans interacted with Abraham Lincoln at the White House. Three of them are gonna be in-person interactions that they had, and one will be correspondence. And again, there are dozens and dozens of moments that I could have chosen from, but I chose these four in addition to Parker because I think each one tells us something different and important about the relationship that Abraham Lincoln developed with African Americans during the Civil War. The first moment will take us somewhere a little bit warmer, take us down to Charleston, South Carolina, and the man you see here on the screen is Robert Smalls. Smalls was a slave in Charleston. He worked aboard a ship, and in May of 1862, he decided he would seize that ship, and you see the ship here as well. This is the CSS Planner. He, he took the ship along with 15 other slaves, his wife, several children, and about a dozen other people. And in the middle of the night, before dawn, in May, one night in May of 1862, they take the ship out of Charleston Harbor, past the Confederate guards at Fort Sumter, and out to the Union blockade. And he turned it over to the Union vessel, and he became a hero for having seized this Confederate ship. A black minister in Washington, D.C., named Henry McNeil Turner, heard Smalls talk about his experiences, and Turner called him a living specimen of unquestionable African heroism. Now, while Smalls was in Washington, D.C., in August of 1862, he traveled to the White House, where he met with Abraham Lincoln. Up to this point of the war, black men had been offering their services to the Union Army for, since going back to April of 1861, and Lincoln had roundly rejected them, in part because he feared that they would be cowardly on the battlefield. But Robert Smalls met with Lincoln at the White House, probably told him the story of his daring and brave escape, and persuaded Lincoln that black men could fight for freedom. And when Smalls returned to Charleston or to Beaufort, South Carolina, he carried with him a letter from the War Department that gave permission to the commander there to raise black soldiers. Smalls had gone from slave to someone meeting with the president in a matter of months. And his story is remarkable because he would go on after the Civil War to be a congressman and he would serve for 10 years between the 1870s and into the 1880s. The second moment I want to talk about involves a black woman from Philadelphia named Carolyn Johnson. We don't have any photographs of her, and so I put on the screen here the White House and then a, a layout of the White House second floor, and you can see the darkened oval place is the White House library, and the photograph at the top right is what the, that room looked like in 1886. I, I couldn't find a, a photograph, but Carolyn Johnson is gonna meet Abraham Lincoln in this room there. She was known in Philadelphia for being able to build beautiful wax fruit displays. And in the spring of 1864, she decided that she would make one of these as a gift for Abraham and Mary Lincoln. She was feeling gratitude to Lincoln for issuing the Emancipation Proclamation, and she spared no time or expense in crafting a beautiful pyramid of wax fruit. She polished it and mounted it on a round table. She surrounded it with an elaborate selection of seashells, and then once she had perfected this design, she covered it with a, a glass bowl. The gift itself cost her $150 to make, and it had a retail value of about $350. Caroline Johnson obtained a letter of, of introduction from an official at the Department of Agriculture, 
And she must have been overjoyed when she found out that she would be received at the White House on Saturday, April 2nd, 1864. Lincoln normally greeted visitors like this in his office on Tuesdays and Fridays. So to meet Lincoln on a Saturday was a pretty special occasion. She traveled from, from Philadelphia to Washington, D.C. with a black Baptist minister from Philadelphia named James Hamilton. They arrived in D.C. on April 1st, and they sent the box containing the gift over to the White House with instructions that it not be opened until she could be there to present it. As an artist, she wanted to make sure that she arranged her gift properly so that it would be displayed as beautifully as possible. The next day, she and Hamilton and one other official went to the White House at 1 p.m. She arranged this fruit display in the library of the White House, this room again that you see on the screen. Now, the library was a large oval-shaped sitting room and it was part of Lincoln's private living quarters. This was not a public space in the White House. President Millard Fillmore had installed bookshelves in the White House Library around 1850, and every president since then had added books to the collection. The room had sitting chairs and sofas. It had a large window facing the unfinished Washington Monument and looking out past that at the Potomac River, and then you could see the Confederate state of Virginia in the distance. This was not a public space. This was a room reserved for family and friends. Lincoln would often go into the library very early in the morning to think or to read before the busyness of the day set in. On Sundays, he would recline on a sofa in that room reading his Bible. In the middle of an exhausting workday, he might sneak away to take a nap. For Lincoln to invite an African-American woman and her pastor into this room made a remarkable statement. It's something that had never been done before. And my sense is that this is probably the first time in the history of the White House that an African-American was welcomed into the private living spaces of the White House other than a servant or a member of the White House staff. And so Mrs. Johnson and Reverend Hamilton and the, the man from the Department of Agriculture who had gotten them the letter of introduction, they show up for a remarkable meeting. They are the only ones there present with Abraham and Mary Lincoln. Well, the president was standing next to Mrs. Johnson while Mary Lincoln, Reverend Hamilton, and the official gathered nearby. Hamilton opened up the conversation. He talked about the past sufferings of his people, the rapid progress of their deliverance, and their hopes for the future. He asked Abraham and Mary Lincoln to accept this gift. He said, as evidence of our confidence and esteem for the chief magistrate who has brought us out of the land of bondage. He then looked at Mrs. Johnson and said, perhaps Mrs. Johnson would like to say a few words. Now, Carolyn Johnson was understandably nervous. Here she is at the White House, sit, standing next to the president. She gazed down at the floor. She felt like she had nothing to say. But after a few moments, she put her hand on her chest. She said she felt as though there was a fire burning inside of her. Later, she said, it burned and burned till it went all over me. I think it was the Holy Spirit. Her mind went to Isaiah 51, which is a passage in the Bible where God promises everlasting comfort and salvation to the suffering. Here's a little excerpt from that passage. Listen to me, you who pursue righteousness. Look to the rock from which you were hewn. Look to, your, look to Abraham, your father. And with these words in her mind, she looked at Abraham Lincoln and she said, Mr. President, I believe God has hewn you out of the rock for this great and mighty purpose. Many have been led away by bribes of gold, of silver, of presents, but you have stood firm because God was with you. And if you are faithful to the end, he will be with you. Now Lincoln is standing there listening to her and he is just visibly moved by her words. And he responded with a few emotional remarks of her own. He thanked her for the beautiful gift. He spoke briefly of the difficulties he had faced and attributed, he said, the wondrous changes of the past three years to the ruling of an all wise providence. Choking back tears, he said, you must not give me the praise. It belongs to God. 
A few more words passed between Johnson and Hamilton and the Lincolns, and then they went outside. It was a chilly day, 37 degrees in Washington that day, but I can't imagine that the cold bothered them. They were overjoyed by their interaction with the president. A third moment that I want to describe for you involves a very famous man, Frederick Douglass. As many of you probably know, Frederick Douglass was born into slavery and in Maryland, and he escaped in 1838 and became one of the most prominent abolitionists of the antebellum era. In August of 1864, Abraham Lincoln invited Douglass to the White House for a meeting. This was the second time of three that they would meet. Now, the summer of 1864 was a low point for the Union war effort and a low point for Abraham Lincoln. Ulysses S. Grant was stuck outside of Richmond, outside of Petersburg. He was unable to capture the Confederate capital, and he had lost tens of thousands of men in the early summer during the Overland, Overland Campaign trying to capture Richmond. Further south, William Tecumseh Sherman was unable to capture Atlanta. And so morale in the north was plummeting, and Lincoln was convinced that he would lose in his bid for re-election later that year, in November of 1864. So Lincoln calls on Frederick Douglass to come to the White House. And the two men sit down together one day in August of 1864, and Lincoln says to him, essentially, I issued the Emancipation Proclamation, and I hoped that slaves would come over into our lines in large numbers, but they just aren't running away as fast as I'd hoped. And he turned to Douglas, and he said this, Douglas, I hate slavery as much as you do, and I want to see it abolished altogether. Well, the two men talked for a while, and they developed a plan, a strategy, how could they get the slaves to run away? Because the idea is, when Lincoln is out of office, the next president is going to rescind the Emancipation Proclamation and the hope for freedom will be gone. And so they developed a plan where they would send bands of scouts into the Confederacy, telling the slaves, run away now, get your freedom now while Lincoln is in office. Fortunately, Lincoln would win re-election and so they never had to carry out this plan. But this plan and this meeting have tremendous significance. It's an incredible moment. Most people, when they think about Lincoln and emancipation, or why Lincoln wanted to free the slaves, they say, well, he did it as a military necessity. He only did it to win the war, to save the Union. But in concocting this plan with Frederick Douglass, it had nothing to do with winning the war. It had nothing to do with military necessity. It had everything to do with Lincoln's desire to make freedom as widespread and as permanent as possible. This was because Lincoln believed that emancipation was the morally right thing to do. This meeting with Douglas had a profound view or a profound impact on how the black abolitionist viewed the 16th president. If you know anything about Frederick Douglass, you know that early in the war, he was highly critical of Abraham Lincoln. He called Lincoln the South's greatest slave hound and abolitionism's worst enemy. But now he saw that Lincoln's heart was fully in emancipation. Douglass later said this, what he said on this day showed me a deeper moral conviction against slavery than any I had ever seen before in anything spoken or written by him. I listened with the deepest interest and profoundest satisfaction. The final moment I want to talk about today involves a young woman who never met Abraham Lincoln. This was early in the Civil War. It was in early 18, or in the middle of the Civil War, in the early 1863. There was a young black teenager, she's probably about 18 years old, living in the nation's capital. She was working in the home of a local shoemaker named Frank Pruitt. And one night, she goes to bed on the sofa in Frank, in Frank Pruitt's store. And it was after dark, and he comes in, and he sits down next to her. And he, she says, who's there? And he says, it is me, Liz Frank. I want to get into bed with you. But you won't tell Lib, will you? In case you couldn't figure out from the context, Lib was his wife. 
Well, Lizzie was tired, and she told him to go away. But the record says, and this is a euphemism, he persevered and got into bed with her, putting his arm around her neck and sleeping with her. And this happened on other occasions as well. When Lizzie realized she was pregnant, he asked if the, she told him, and he asked if the baby was his, and she confirmed that it was. A baby girl was born around November 3rd, 1863. Sometime around Christmas, 1863, Frank told Lizzie that he wanted her to get out of the house and to take the child with her. And she replied that she would only leave if he gave her financial support. But he refused. He said, I've got a bedstead you can have if you want. That was all he would give. A few months later, Lizzie learned that Frank was going to kick her out of the house. And so she decided to confront him in front of his wife. So the next morning, on a Sunday, Lizzie packed up her belongings, dressed her baby, and knocked on the Pruitt's bedroom door. Frank stayed in bed while his wife, who had just had a baby of her own, got up and answered the door. Lizzie went in and told Frank, look at the baby and look at me and remember what you have done to me. And he simply replied, well. She then reminded him that he had promised to take care of the child. And when he wouldn't do that, she said, I will disgrace you on the morrow if he didn't give financial support. Well, Frank Pruitt became angry at that point. He turned to his wife and he said, Lib, do you believe that damned black bitch? And she said, yes, Frank, I do. For the last three months, you have acted as though you were afraid of Liz. At that, Frank jumped out of bed. He grabbed a revolver from his dresser. And he shouted, God damn you, I never intended to die a natural death, and I will blow your damned brains out. He then grabbed, but his wife grabbed the pistol and scolded him. Frank, a murder over my child. At that, Frank lunged at Lizzie, grabbed her by the neck, shoved her against the wall, and went to choke her. And he ordered her out of the house. Well, Lizzie hurried away with her baby in her arms. When she came back a few hours later to get her belongings, Mrs. Pruitt gave her some money to keep her story quiet. But she wouldn't keep her story quiet. The next morning, she went to a judge in the courthouse in D.C., which Lincoln statue now, now stands outside of. And she wanted to file a complaint against Pruitt, but the first judge refused. She then went to another judge who issued a warrant. Unfortunately, Frank Pruitt decided to act as well and he had Lizzie arrested for grand larceny that very same day, claiming that she had stolen the money that his wife gave her. She spent the, west, the rest of the week in prison before being released on bail. In June of 1864, Frank went to trial for his crimes against Lizzie. Lizzie told her story in court, which was an incredible thing for an African American to be able to testify against a white person in that era. But several white witnesses impugned her character with their own testimony, and the judge acquitted Pruitt. Sometime around her trial, her baby girl died. Lizzie went to trial in October of 1864, and she was found guilty. On November 3rd, 1864, what would have been her girl's first birthday, she was sentenced to a year in prison in New York at the Albany Penitentiary. The following day, with nowhere left to turn, she sent a letter to President Lincoln. She was unable to read or write herself, and so an unknown hand wrote it for her. And you see part of the first page of her letter here on the screen. She wrote some of this. The fault was my own for which I was convicted, but I most solemnly declare before my maker that I am guilty of no crime. She explained how in an evil hour she gave way to the importunities of Mr. Pruitt and became pregnant with his child. Having nowhere left to turn, she implored Lincoln for mercy. And she said that the money she was accused of stealing had been given to her, she said, by Mrs. Pruitt on condition that I would say nothing of the connection between myself and Mr. Pruitt. And again, unable to write, she marked her name with an X. I like to think about Lincoln sitting in his White House office, reviewing this case file and reading her letter. 
Lincoln didn't keep a diary, he didn't keep a journal, so we don't know what went through his head at this moment. But I can imagine what he might have thought about. Lincoln's genealogy had some striking similarities to Lizzie Shorter's story. Lincoln believed that his mother's conception was the result of a wealthy Virginia planter taking sexual advantage of a poor young girl. And according to Lincoln's law partner, this was a painful memory for Lincoln. Lincoln also had very strong misgivings about society's moral inconsistencies in cases of seduction. He thought it was unjust that women received more blame than men who participated in sexual indiscretions. And it's something he even wrote a poem about when he was a young man. This is what he wrote. Whatever spiteful fools may say, each jealous ranting yelper, no woman ever played the whore unless she had a man to help her. Now, I've been to the Lincoln Memorial several times, and I've always looked to see if they carve that on the wall. I haven't seen it yet, but maybe one day those immortal words will wind up next to the Gettysburg Address. At any rate, Frank Pruitt's sexual exploitation of Lizzie Shorter clearly offended Lincoln's sense of justice. And he also must have felt sympathy and empathy for a young mother. Lincoln knew the grief of losing a child, having lost two sons of his own. And so, considering all of the evidence on hand and moved with compassion, Lincoln issued a pardon on November 5th, 1864, uh, before she could even be sent to prison in New York. And Lincoln wrote these words that you see here. This is the very back side of her letter. Pardon A. Lincoln, November 5, 1864. I think Elizabeth Shorter's pardon may be the fastest that Lincoln ever granted during his administration. And making the timing all the more remarkable is that three days later, Lincoln would stand for re-election for his second term in office. The story of Elizabeth Shorter is an important one. Although completely unknown today, it confirms Lincoln's belief that all people deserved fairness and equality before the law. He knew that Lizzie Shorter had been wronged, and so he did what he could to rectify the situation. He strove to be a president who acted upon principles of equality, regardless of a person's race, color, sex, or condition of servitude. And incidentally, something I learned recently, just in the last few weeks, is that Lizzie Shorter became free when Lincoln signed a law freeing the slaves in Washington, D.C. on April 16, 1862. So in a sense, by pardoning her, he was fulfilling the promise of the law that he had signed. In taking this action, Lincoln, in the quiet of his White House office, captured the essence of what he said at Gettysburg when he called for a new birth of freedom so that government of the people, by the people, and for the people would not perish from the earth. I think in listening to her petition, he was recognizing her as a member of the people whose rights would be protected. Now, hundreds of African Americans met Lincoln in wartime Washington, this is an image of black refugees who met at a contraband or who were living at a contraband camp in Washington D.C. And in this image, they were photographed getting ready to sing for Lincoln. And there are accounts that survive of Lincoln going and singing with them, not just listening, but singing with them, tears welling in his eyes as he sang with these people who were seeking freedom. With others, he met them at, at public receptions or in private meetings. Some of the people he met were famous, others were not well known then and are all but forgotten today. For three years, President Lincoln welcomed black visitors into the White House with an outstretched hand, treating them with dignity and respect. Many were touched by how he shook their hands and made no acknowledgement of their race or skin color. In 1864, Frederick Douglass proudly told a friend, quote, he treated me as a man. He did not let me feel for a moment that there was any difference in the color of our skins. The president is a most remarkable man. On another occasion, Lincoln or Douglass told an audience that when he was at the White House, he said, I felt big there. 
But it wasn't only famous people that Lincoln treated with dignity and respect. In, August, or in February of 1864, two black army doctors, Alexander T. Augusta and Anderson R. Abbott, met with Lincoln at a White House reception. Augusta was born in the 1820s right here in Norfolk, in, in Tidewater, Virginia. They were uninvi uninvited. They went to this reception in February of 1864, and the white members of the crowd looked on with a mixture of anger and disbelief and admiration and wonder. Mary Lincoln was there, and she sent her son Robert over to the president to say, are you going to allow this to happen? And Lincoln turned to his son and said, why not? Lincoln then shook both of these men's hands eagerly. Lincoln's private secretary, William Stoddard, was there, and he later said, I will never forget the sensation produced when these two tall and very well-dressed Africans came to pay their respects. Stoddard called their brave act a practical assertion of Negro citizenship. And he said, watching them show up uninvited and shaking the president's hand, he said it was as good as a play. A few months later, in April of 1864, six black men from North Carolina came to the White House to call on Lincoln to give black men the right to vote. Their leader was a former slave named Abraham Galloway, who you see pictured here. And one of the members of the delegation later gave a speech where he talked about what it was like to meet Lincoln. And he said they were shocked that they were welcomed through the front door of the White House. This man said it would have been considered an insult for a person of color to enter, he said, the front door of the lowest magistrate in Craven County and ask for the smallest right. He said that if an offender had done such a thing, he would have been told, quote, go around to the back door. That is the place for the N-words. But then in words alluding to the Sermon on the Mount, this black visitor said, alluding to Lincoln like Christ, he said, we knock and the door is opened to us. We seek the president and find him to the joy and comfort of our hearts. We ask and receive his sympathies and promises to do for us all he could. He didn't tell us to go around to the back door, but like a true gentleman and noble-hearted chief, with as much courtesy and respect as though we were the Japanese embassy, he invited us into the White House. And Lincoln shook each of their hands and told them that he would do what he could to support them in their struggle for the right to vote. And in fact, beginning right at that time, in the spring of 1864, Lincoln began push, working behind the scenes to try to win black suffrage in the state of Louisiana. Another visitor in October of 1864 was Sojourner Truth. Sojourner Truth met with Lincoln, and Lincoln showed her a Bible that had just been given to her, him earlier that year by black ministers from Baltimore. And this is a, a recreated image of the two of them looking at the Bible. And on the left-hand side of your screen there, you see the golden plate that's on the front of the Bible. And they, they had a wonderful conversation together and they, as they looked at this Bible together. And Sojourner Truth, shortly after the meeting, said, that she felt like she was in the presence of a friend. Now, Lincoln understood that there could be a steep political cost to pay for welcoming black visitors into his home and office, but he did it anyway. Newspapers throughout the North and the South, in fact, reported on his meetings with African Americans, and many heaped scorn upon him for the kind reception that he gave them. The N-word was ubiquitous in these reports. Lincoln's welcoming of African Americans to the White House was an act of great political courage and great political risk. Prior to the White House, African Americans would be more likely to be bought and sold as slaves by a sitting president than to be welcome as visitors. But he didn't shy away from having public meetings with black visitors Again, even in the run-up to the presidential election of 1864. In September of 1864, a, a Democratic newspaper in Philadelphia called The Age issued a, a story on what was going on. And this is a little bit of what they said. With Negro picnics in the White House grounds, 
and Negro cronies in the White House itself displaying their teeth at the presidential whip. White people will have to wait a long time for their turn. And then the editors then said, Mr. Lincoln was like the conscientious actor who, when he played Othello, insisted on blacking himself all over. Lincoln knew that newspaper coverage like this could cost him votes, but that didn't stop him from welcoming black people into his home and office. And I'm going to close with just a couple of lines from Frederick Douglass, because I think Frederick Douglass, more than anyone else, understood the importance of Lincoln's open-door policy. And so these are Douglass's words. He said this, he knew that he could do nothing which would call down upon him more fiercely the ribaldry of the vulgar than by showing respect to the colored man. And yet that's exactly what Lincoln did. Douglas continued, some men there are who, will, who can face death and dangers, but have not the moral courage to contradict a prejudice or face ridicule. In daring to admit, nay, in daring to invite a Negro to an audience at the White House, Mr. Lincoln did that which he knew would be offensive to the crowd and excite the ribaldry. It was saying to the country, I am the president of the black people as well as the white, and I mean to respect their rights and feelings as men and citizens. Thank you so much for joining me here. I wish I could be with you on person, but I'm thrilled to be here at the Hampton History Museum virtually. And I think that if you're putting questions in the comments, they'll come over to me. So um, I look forward to getting those. Thank you, Jonathan. Wonderful presentation. I'm out of breath. I forgot my microphone. I had to take oh, a quick okay. lap around the building. So. <laughs> Thank you for your patience. Uh, wonderful presentation. We do have a couple of questions. Uh, one from Michelle. Uh, was there a specific pivotal event or correspondence uh, of which you know that woke President Lincoln to the horrors of slavery? The, so Lincoln grew up in Kentucky. He was born in Kentucky, grows up there before moving to Indiana as a young boy. And it's believed that the Lincoln would have seen coffles of slaves near his home, so he may have seen those as a young boy. The moment that's generally seen as pivotal were the moments. Lincoln took two flatboat trips to New Orleans, one in 1828 and one in 1831. And he almost certainly saw slave sales on those trips and saw the, the horror and the injustice of slavery. And so I think that those are the moments where Lincoln firmly came to see the evil of slavery. Now, Lincoln was not an abolitionist, and that's an important thing to notice. So he was an anti-slavery politician. From a 21st century perspective, he was very moderate. And even in a 19th century perspective, he was seen as more moderate than an abolitionist like Douglas or like William Lloyd Garrison. But he said as an adult, there was never a time in his life when he could remember not believing slavery was morally wrong. And so whether it was in a very early moment seeing slave coffles or as an adult on those trips or one other moment that had a profound impact on him was in 1841 or 42, he saw a, a coffle of slaves on a boat on the Ohio River being transported down into the, the South. And in 1855, he wrote a letter to his friend Joshua Speed. And he said, that has been a continual, that sight has been a continual torment to me. And he said, I see that every time I go on the Ohio River. And so he, those sights, I think, were um, very instrumental in, in causing him to take the anti-slavery positions he did. All right, I'm, I'm, there's another here that, uh, there we go, um, from Pat. Apparently Lincoln's parents uh, were anti-slavery, although did they have slaves? Uh, what is your comment on that? Yeah, so Lincoln's parents went to an anti-slavery, what was called Primitive Baptist Church in Kentucky. They moved to Indiana for two reasons. 
It was Lincoln's words partly on account of slavery and partly on account of land titles. Thomas Lincoln had purchased a lot of land, and in Kentucky they measured land on what was called meets and bounds, and so it's kind of like I own the land from here to that rock over there. It wasn't very precise. He lost a lot of money in lawsuits and property, and so they moved to Indiana where land was measured by surveyors and um, using more, sophisticate, more sophisticated techniques. And so, yes, his family was anti, or his parents were against slavery and made that move to Indiana, a free state, partly on account of it was a free state. That said, Lincoln's parents had both been born in Virginia, and there was slaveholding in their family going back. And there's a Lincoln homestead, a Lincoln family homestead in near Harrisonburg, Virginia. And my recollection is that there's a cemetery, a little family cemetery outside of that property, and that there are slaves buried in there. So there's a myth, Lincoln never owned slaves. He did try to purchase a slave during the Civil War, which I'll tell very briefly. Lincoln never owned slaves, and I don't believe his parents ever did either. After Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, there was a slave who ran away from a Kentucky owner who was a friend of Lincoln's, a guy named George Robertson and he was finding safety with a Wisconsin regiment. And Lincoln sent a letter to George Robertson saying, can I buy your slave for $500? Now Lincoln didn't want to buy a slave to own a slave. He wanted to buy the slave and set him free so that George Robertson would stop trying to pursue him in the courts because Lincoln was worried that the Emancipation Proclamation could, would be struck down in, by a judge. And so Lincoln did try to purchase the slave as president but it, it wasn't to perpetuate, but rather to end slavery. And for the record, George Robertson would not sell. He refused. Interesting. Uh, another question from Judith. Uh, did Andrew Johnson continue uh, the practice of welcoming? That's a great question. In 1865, Andrew Johnson does welcome some African Americans to the White House. And he seems to treat them fairly well. And he does treat several black visitors in the White House fairly well in 1866 as well. One was named Paschal Randolph, who had met with Lincoln, then met Johnson. Another was Sojourner Truth, who met with both of them. But Johnson generally did not treat African Americans nearly as well as Lincoln did. And there's a lot of irony here. When Johnson was military governor of Tennessee, he gave a speech at the state capitol or outside of it where he said, I'm going to be the Moses of the colored people, he said. And, uh, you know, they believed him at the time. And he believed himself. And I think he continued to believe himself. But then once he becomes president, he does not support black rights the way that Lincoln was coming to support them. And, you know, the, the moment or one of the pivotal moments in, in Johnson's relationship with African Americans comes in February of 1866, where a group of black people comes to the White House, Frederick Douglass is among them, and they're pushing for the right to vote. And whereas Lincoln meets with at least three delegations of African Americans and says, yeah, I support your right to vote, I can't do anything as president, but he begins to work behind the scenes to, to push for it. Johnson is adamantly opposed to it, and after that delegation leaves, he calls Frederick Douglass the N-word and says that it just says terrible things about Douglass. And what happens is over time, African Americans don't feel like they're welcome anymore at the White House. So in the epilogue of the book, I trace this process during the post-war years. By the time Ulysses S. Grant is in the White House, there's a night where Mrs. Grant is going to have a party, and a servant comes to her and says, if, if black people come to the party, what do we do? And Mrs. Grant says, well, it's my party, let them in. And none came. And Mrs. Grant writes in her memoirs about how black people just stopped coming at that point. And by the time you get to 1901, when, um, when, the president, invite, when president Roosevelt invites um, Booker T. Washington to the White House, people are just people in the South, white people in the South, are just losing their minds over it, saying, this is unprecedented. You can't invite an African American to the White House like he's doing. And uh, so I think the memory and the tradition that started in the Lincoln White House very sadly disappeared over the second half of the 19th century. All right. Uh, the other question I can answer. Uh, you can find the book here in our bookshop. Uh, let me turn on my microphone. 
Uh, you can find the book here in our bookshop, uh, so please feel free to drop by. The bookshop is open from 10 until 4, uh, Monday through Saturday, and then we are open from 1 until 5 on Sunday. So you can uh, drop by and pick up a copy of the book. Uh, thank you, Jonathan, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, I certainly enjoyed it, and it sounds like from the uh, comments uh, I am monitoring here on Facebook Live, uh, a well-enjoyed presentation by our, by our friends. So thank you Great. again. Thank you.